So let's start by making, I have some issues with the presentation, which is always great when you talk about technology and future technology. Um, but you know, there is something about the fact that I cannot see my presenter notes. Um, can I get some help? Sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna sing in the meantime because we are in an opera. So probably as a representing of Italian culture. I just need to see the presenter uh, notes on here. Thank you, sorry. I'm gonna sing in the meantime. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, woo, woo. Uh, if, if my Wadenki can play for me in the meantime, I'm gonna try to do a Pavarotti impersonation, but uh, I don't know what to do. Anyway, I'm very happy to, to be here in Kik, uh, and uh, let's see if we're almost there. Yes. No? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, because I'm gonna talk about AI and technology, so I think Keynote is almost not there. Yeah? No. Okay, it's okay, I'm gonna wing it. Uh, no problem. It's okay, thank you. All right, uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about intelligence and AI. Uh, I think a lot of people are gonna talk about AI. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you how to make your life easier, how to make money with it. I'm actually probably gonna say how to make the opposite, so how to make your life harder. Um, <laughs> my name is Simone Rebaudengo. Uh, what the algorithms say is that I'm a film director, apparently. Uh, I made once a short movie about a a person that teaches objects, and somehow I became a film director, but uh, anyway, I'm something like a designer. Uh, I write books as well. But- Can really AI, can really be AI. Ooh, <laughs> wow, technology. So uh, anyway, so as I've been talking, I wanna talk about AI, I wanted to show you a video that kind of represent pretty much the, the situation where we're in today, uh, which is this. It uses AI to bring AI, 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 AI. Yes, so that's kind of where we are today. Um, so I'm really interested about generally artificial intelligence and technology, but not necessarily about what we can do today and how hype it is, but more about how it's something that is a very, very old technological dream of us. Uh, it's 100 years that we've been trying to do the same thing. Uh, we've been trying to automate our life, to make our life easier. Uh, this is some images from the 50s where we were kind of thinking about these robot maids and to you know, make things for us, but always with the same premise that we're gonna save time, but to do what? Um, for me, AI, it's interesting. It's also because it's this very, very weird quest to beat us at all the fun things. Uh, this is the this famous image of uh, Gary Kasparov when he, le when he lost against Deep Blue, so the first human that lost at a game against a machine, which is super sad. I mean, look at him, he's like destroyed. But it's also for me, this picture, I love it because it also shows the other side of this discussion, which is this guy. <laughs> you know, this guy is the um, mother -mfer that is really, really happy about machine becoming better than us, and kind of the, the poster child of this idea that if you throw as much computation as we can to any problem, we can solve it, being games or something else. Uh, but, you know, artificial intelligence is interesting because it's something that is constantly going to be good in the future. So we don't know yet now, I mean, we're going to lose our jobs and everything, but, you know, it's going to be good in the future. Uh, we don't know when, but it's going to happen. And we, have to, and we have to be optimists. Uh, I don't know if you ever read the Techno Optimist Manifesto from Andres and Horowitz. It's disgusting. Uh, but it kind of tells us that we cannot, we cannot, you know, it's gonna happen and it's gonna be great. Uh, but also we have a lot of fears, you know, there is a lot of ideas that, you know, it's gonna take over our life, it's gonna take over the world. But what's, what I find funny about it is that, you know, all we got now is chatbots. Uh, and you know, even the, the biggest dystopias where we had these machines coming over and terminators and coming for us, actually even the dystopias now are really boring because it's just gonna be a chatbot tricking us to take over the world. Uh, this is actually the, I don't know if you ever saw the paper that talks about how a chat, a chat GPT 
managed to, um, to trick a knowledge worker like a task rabbit to actually solve a captcha for him. So that's kind of how AI will talk over the world, not by killing us, but just by tricking us. Um, so it was supposed to be robots. I think for many years we were all waiting for robots to come uh, to take over some of our jobs. Uh, this is Bruno, I think was the saddest robot of all time because it's this like six axis magnificent machine which actually was used to move a pizza from point A to point B on a single plane. And I was, I'm very happy for Bruno because luckily, you know, he's probably gonna go back to make cars instead of making pizza. But you know, there is this narrative that we have constantly that AI is something that is gonna take our job. And this is like, you know, an article for 2016 that was talking about robots still. You know, we didn't talk about AI, we talked about robots who are coming from our job. And you know, constantly we have this impending fear that something's gonna happen. You know, we, and, and, and this narrative goes on and on and on and it's just becoming worse. But also I feel design, you know, I'm a designer and I'm always in love with the fact that designers ourselves, we have this masochistic dream of automating design and making it easy. So we, we actually, make ourselves redundant by creating solutions for ourselves. So actually, if you are fearing AI, don't fear AI, but probably fear the person on your left, because some of you is actually developing something that is gonna take over your job. So, okay. And you know, and when you look on the internet, it's amazing, there is this, now it's a crazy division and there is FOMO, there is fear, there are fights, there is no AI movements, there is uh, articles about how to beat AI FOMO, how to beat AI fatigue, the seven, the 20, the five ways. And actually I found last night, I was searching for last images, I found this one on the left, which I love because, I mean, of course there is Terminator as a designer, but the detail, which I love, is that he's actually designing by lasering from a wireframe into a visual. I mean, if that happens, fuck yeah, take my job. <laughs> I mean, absolutely, you know, that's amazing. But you know, the more we get these images and now, you know, there is mid journey. I was actually just looking up and I was looking at this thing today and, and I'm like, fuck, do we really need mid journey? Like it's, it's already, this is very nice. But, uh, but you know, we are, we are very, very fast growing off and becoming bored of this imagery. You know, a lot of speakers probably are gonna use me journey to make their slides. Um, I don't know what to do uh, anymore with that, so I'm just making fake pictures of my just born daughter, so I don't have to post her on Instagram. So, so that's actually the synthetic version of my daughter. But you know, we, are, you know, we don't know, really know what to do because you know, we can make a lot of images very fast. And also, while we have and especially when you look at the real world, you know, while Roombas are really cool robots and I really love them and they are in everywhere in the house, the only form of physical intelligence that we have in our house are still these sort of weird talking cylinders. So, so I think you know, the, it's interesting because we're really trying to, to make design easy, make our life fast, to try and automate everything and now, you know, AI and all these things used to be blue, but now it, it kind of was rebranded to these like purple magic sparkly things. You know, everywhere in all the tools you have this stuff and it's kind of cute, you know, you're not scared of it anymore. But at the same time, it's really scary because, you know, I don't know what to do anymore. You know, if I can generate everything, if I can, you know, ask how to I have an idea, what will I do? So what are we doing? Uh, so I don't know if you are in the same situation, but actually like four years ago, uh, I started a company called Oyo together with my friend uh, Matteo to actually try and figure out what else we should do in this world. So rather than uh, going towards the idea of making more and more efficient tools and making our life easier, the, the way we, we want to do, actually the, the motto of our company is that we're making products and tools for a less boring future. So we don't want to make stuff easy, we want to imagine what else we can do. And that means a bunch of things because like designers in the past, you know, like uh, and I'm from Italy and you know, we have this story, history of designers with beards and with, uh, with 
you know, glasses and they were looking at materials and touching them, going to talk to engineers and trying, you know, by shaping these materials, the, whether it's wood or plastic, also making things that would change the, the culture, the perspective. And I think today, you know, that's kind of what we want to do. We actually want to use intelligence or kind of smartness to, to shape products and experiences, but also new, new perspective about our life. And what does it mean? So we, we use it to explore what else we can do. Uh, so for instance, recently we just figured out that we can use AI to change everything into hot dogs very fast. It's very good, so you, know, you can do that yourself. Um, we also like to not only use AI, but actually think how sim simple things might change. So recently we made a, a project for the Milano Design Week where they asked us to come with a perspective about AI and product design, and we said, well, anyway, no one will draw in the future, so here is a pencil that doesn't have graphite, because that's going to be the pencil in the future. Uh, but also, I think we, we are looking at intelligence not only as a technology, but more as a way to find new metaphors of what products can become. Uh, this is an old project we did with uh, IKEA, where we, we basically gave agency to, to chairs to evolve by themselves. So to kind of find a way to update themselves to become, um, you know, to stay relevant over time. So actually what I want to show you today is a few things that we do a bit under the hood of what we do in our, uh, let's say, studio, but also something that I feel like it's almost like a survival guide not to have fear, FOMO, or kind of be bored with these times of everything being AI. So the first thing I think it's, uh, that we did, and I think I, it could be fun to do, is to make and hire uh, your own bots. So rather than you know, having ChatGPT, I think there is something about creating uh, your own bots. And because we, so we started the company in 2020, and 2020 probably was the best time to start a company. Uh, you know, like, few things happened. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, like, pandemics and, uh, but you know, 2020 was supposed to be much cooler, uh, but it really wasn't. So actually what we decided is, is that because we were in two and we, there was not a lot of work around, maybe the best way to start a studio is not by hiring people, but actually by hiring non-human bots. It's definitely cheaper. So the way we talk about ourselves is also like a team of humans and machines. So this is a visualization of Robbie. So Robbie doesn't really look like this, but we like to, you know, make some 3D stuff. But Robbie is our first hire and actually the first non-human AI creative director. Uh, and Robbie lives, actually is a mix of many different algorithms that are living within our Discord channel. So it does a lot of things from making haikus to showing Pokemons uh, to, you know, very useful stuff that you need in a design studio. Uh, but, you know, but the nice thing about it is that it's not that smart but it's super sharp. Uh, and I love because it's this very tiny, you know, it's not very intelligent, but it's just, you know, it cuts through the bullshit. Uh, you know, with, over the time, over the years, also we gave Robbie more tools like to, you know, make his own ideas because it's like, you know, we want you to be part of the team, so show us what you got. Uh, and these are some of my favorites. So the, I think the high quality shoe peeling knife is definitely a good idea. Uh, or also mobile phone emergency exit tool cosplay. So we don't know yet what it is. So, you know, this is kind of old school AI, as you can see, like it's, it's very, it's actually nice, you know, it's nonsensical, but I think in the, in the nonsense machines and art, you can find beauty and your own inspirations. Uh, it used to be, Robbie used to be on Instagram before he was dramatically banned. Uh, there is a big hate on bots. Uh, on, on social media, I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he, he, so Robbie used to, you know, post images and very cheesy quotes. He was also commenting on other people, and then he got banned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also put him on LinkedIn because, you know, if, if you are on LinkedIn, it means you're real. Uh, and uh, yeah, we didn't make him post on LinkedIn because it would be too easy to make really cheesy posts uh, uh, there. 
But, you know, and we made it open source, so it's, it's, it's not that complicated, it's not that big, but I think now a lot of other small studios, friends of us are using it, so actually if you wanna add Ruby to your studio, you can actually do it. But some time ago we, we decided, no, let's go, you know, let's also make a bigger bot, like let's use some of these new capabilities of large language models, and, and we started to figure out, hey, can we make a new one that is not as dumb, but it's actually very smart and it can embed the personality of our studio, our world, uh, you know, fascinations and what we do in our free time. And, and it's called Yobi, so Yobi is a friend of Robby, as you can see we have a very strong naming uh, brand. Uh, but Yobi and Robby are actually by themselves on a channel discussing, so Robby, <laughs> Robby, <laughs> Robbie says ping and Yobi says pong, then you know Robbie puts some Pokemons and, and Yobi asks what is his point of view about philosophy of design. Uh, but <laughs> but Robbie doesn't really say anything back beside your files or pong. But but actually I think I don't know, I, I kind of hate Yobi now. Uh, it's way too sh smart and, and I don't know, it's, I, I, I kind of want to deprecate it. And uh, because, you know, recently actually started insulting our own uh, developer for some reason, saying that it was sloppy. And I was, okay, okay, we're going a bit to Microsoft here, like let's, let's, let's get back. So I think there is something there again, you know, making conversation, making intelligence that are not that smart, uh, rather than all these, in, you know, big LLM stuff. So the second thing, that I wanna talk about is, so first you can make your intelligence and you can figure out what they do and you can kind of play with them, you can do whatever, but I think what's interesting is also how do we use all of this to find new ideas? So rather than just you know, replicating our, what we do already, uh, you know, how can we find new things? So I don't know you, I mean clearly, as you can hear, I'm Italian, English is not my first language, uh, prompting is not you know, words are not my, my best weapon. So, and also when you think about it today, you know, all these tools that we can actually, you know, write and generate stuff, they're really not good because in, in some way they're, you know, everything is linear and I don't, th I don't think we think linearly, you know. It's really hard to, to, you know, a chat is not a way to think. A chat is a way to make a conversation, which of course is interesting. So we're thinking, okay, how, how can you use all of these, like we can, create ideas, we can visualize them, but, but actually make something else. So a few, like last summer, we, we've been uh, reached from Space 10 and IKEA. So Space 10 used to be uh, Innovation Lab of IKEA. And they asked us a, a very simple question, which is, can we rethink how we make sustainable products with the help of AI? And we said, sure. I mean, of course we can. Um, and I think what's interesting about it is that we, we're looking, okay, like, can we actually just let the, so let ourselves be in a conversation with some of these AIs or some of these, uh, these models to try and figure out some ideas. So anyway, a lot of ideas come out of weird conversation and if you push these things really on some weird angles, you can actually get to some really weird stuff. And so what we did is we, we did this project called Product of Place. Uh, and the premise of this was that um, can, if we can actually figure out a way to, to come up with ideas based on some different variables than the one that we have as people. And so, the, bear with me a second, but the, this is a bit of a rant about how things are made, but you know, there is a reason why we have you know, the same chairs, the same plates everywhere in the world because they kind of emerge from, you know, industrialization processes and from the fact that, you know, things are just cheaper to be made, be made like that. But something interesting instead is like if we look for instance at nature or like the way products used to be done before, um, you know, they kind of come up, they emerge from what is most abundant and what is most uh, fit to the context. And of course, you know, like, of course you can say, yeah, let's solve the world by making only local products, but at the same time you, you, know, you need to have this insane ability to figure out what is contextual, what is abundant everywhere. And actually that's where it's interesting to, to figure out how to do that with the help and partnering with a machine. So what we did was we, we started this process kind of weirdly by starting to, to talk to a bunch of different 
algorithms, and in this case, ChatGPT, and talk about like defining together what's abundant. So what is abundant in a place and that we can use? And, and surprisingly enough, uh, from a machine standpoint, industrial waste is the most abundant thing. So it's not necessarily natural resources, but from a machine point of view, it's actually, I don't know, oil production waste. So we kind of get into this thing and we, we created this whole process where we ask, okay, what is most abundant? But why is that? And then we, we threw that in and make it into a, a brief for another AI, in this case, like something that, like mid-journey, that can, um, you know, it can visualize what we did. So we, we started to create these weird kind of briefs to come up, okay, a photo of a plate made of olive waste. And, you know, you start to get into some interesting stuff because as, as soon as you start traveling and figuring out, you know, that maybe in Helsinki, paper pulp is uh, something very abundant, so that's what, what the plate could look like. Um, and, and also we took place because it's a very, you know, no one thinks about plates. So we said, okay, I think AI should think about plates. Uh, but also, you know, Budapest, you know, thermal waste. And you start to get these weird, nice things, but they're not really products yet. But then, you know, we're like, okay, of course we could have done some nice render and editing, but what if we instead we use the whole world, like a map of the world, there's almost like a, a space to come up with ideas. And so, and what's interesting about it is you start to kind of build up this idea that every place is, um, is abundant for something, you realize that even small geographical distance can come up with, with very, very different things. Like, you know, Munich, I mean, clearly Munich is beer bottles, the, <laughs> the most abundant material. But then you get, you know, in Stuttgart, auto parts, and around Zurich, like, you know, birch wood, I think. And so you can see how very small distance can create very different products. And so we kind of created this way that rather than actually, you know, writing and na na na, we created a map almost as a thinking tool to travel through, through inspiration where you can actually go, you know, just by clicking, you can go from Odessa to Japan to US and find these weird ideas. And so what we did ended up doing is created this infinite atlas of plate-like stuff. Uh, which is kind of beautiful. Uh, and, and as you start looking into this, I think it's ama amazing what you find because for some reason in Halifax, which is in Northern Canada, uh, lobster shell are, uh, are the main abundant material. So, you know, that's what a plate from Ikea would look like there. Or tennis ball in Brisbane, because I guess there is some ATP tennis something there, but, you know, something beautiful. Or also, you know, you can figure out realize that, you know, you can have very different functionality of a plate. Like, you know, in Amsterdam, why not having a bike light uh, plate or Hamburg is this kind of weird shipping container one. And also there is just some stuff that I don't know how we managed to make because it was all sort of like automated, but you know, this robotics parts plate or this one from Vilnius with textile stuff. And this is just like an overview of um, of what we did. I can actually breathe. I have 15 minutes, that's great. Uh, so, uh, you can actually try this yourself. So we made it available. Uh, this tool is on pop, pop products of fails.oyo.studio. Uh, if you wanna make any of these plates, please do. I don't think, I mean, there is, a, I, I, I challenge you to go to Chengdu, China and see actually what a plate would be made of there. Uh, I'm just gonna say Panda and <laughs> byproducts of Panda. <laughs> uh, but of course, you know, all of these are just images and you know, like they're not really products yet. So we also tried to convince Ikea to actually make up this, this real, like to, to go around and make some, some plates from all over the world. And so, you know, there is some little bit of work to do from an image to imagine actually a plate. And, and these are just some shots of products that we would have liked to make. So this is actually coming from nearby Incheon in Korea. It's like a e-waste plate. Uh, this is from around Mexico that it's using like fast, fesh, fast fashion scraps and, uh, and the Hennekin fiber. Uh, and this is like from, the, from Copenhagen. It's, it's kind of food packaging waste. Um, so that's that for that. So 
The last part that I want to talk about is kind of going even further. So we, we made our bots, we made a way to do weird stuff with them. We, we created some tools to kind of chain together these like text and other stuff. And then you're like, okay, so what? But then what do you do? So, you know, I, I, <laughs> I kind of really like, this is kind of where we are now. You know, everybody's gangsta until, until you, you go from a concept to a thing. Because it's like, it's easy to make images, but can we actually make real stuff with this? Um, and so, now two years ago, we started a project that, uh, really with the idea of can we actually make, from start to end, a product fully made in collaboration with a machine, so where we are in a constant conversation at every step and every decision, so kind of giving up a little bit of our agency, but also getting this sort of other perspective at every point. And, and so we were thinking, okay, what is, what is the most manual or the most uh, collaborative way of, of working with, with algorithms? So rather than using you know, these, these things, you, you click, you get an image, can we go back to some of the, you know, the earlier tools, the ones that were a little bit more manual, more kind of complex to build, uh, and with the idea that you, know, like you can actually start working with, you know, with your own things. And so we, we looked back and, you know, this is like, you know, what I now feel it's like the old school glitchy manual AI. These are images from, I think, 2018 from Mario Klingemann when style GANs were really cool. Uh, you know, you could, uh, I mean, you could not very easily, like you could launch this mega model with like a million images and, and travel through it to find these very weird things, but this very, I don't know, there is something to, you know, when you see an image made by a very polished image, you know, there is nothing to the imagination. But when you see what, what these old tools were doing, it's like there is a lot that you can interpret and you can get inspired by. I mean, I don't know necessarily about this one because it's kind of between a penguin and a, what is it, with a panda, penguin? I don't know, Dra dragon, <laughs> owl. It's an owl, penguin, panda, dragon. Okay, cat. <laughs> as well. Actually cats, so this is a bit of a diversion. Cats are the, there used to be the, the most present thing in, uh, in machine learning for a long time. So you, for, for a long time you couldn't find any other data set images than just cats and human faces. So there is a conspiracy there. For, cats are behind AI for sure. <laughs> so, so anyway, so the idea here, okay, let's make something with, uh, with, with, with a machine, let's make it in a very difficult way, but what should we do? Um, and going back, you know, it's, as an Italian designer, you always have these, a lot of these quotes and references that you can use to sound very, very you know, knowledgeable about history, but um, you know, back in, um, in the 50s, uh, Ernesto Nathan Rogers had this quote in a, in a number of domus where he was talking about how you know, designers are embedding you know, the, the, the view and the, the situation of a particular time in every object that they do. And they kind of should be able to design everything from a spoon to the city. And of course, this was very like the, the very you know, super designer point of view. And, um, and you know, what we thought is, okay, if we are in a time where actually machines are much, you know, they could become designers, you know, they also should be able to embed that view in everything from a spoon to the city. So rather than starting designing cities with AI, we thought that maybe we should just start uh, with a spoon. That was a long, uh, you know, this is when you have to find a reverse engineering concept to find why did you make a spoon. You know, you go back, you find a quote, and then you make a whole slide about it, and, and that's where I am now to tell you that we made a spoon. Actually, I really just like spoon, you know. That, that's the truth. So we, we thought about, we kind of created our own process that uh, very smartly we called artisanal intelligence instead of artificial, but really to kind of talk about the fact that we, we wanted to really make every single step from ideation to production something that is a constant uh, collaboration. Uh, we also made a very, very scientific diagram about our process. So, you know, we, we went from you know, kind of curating our own data set and training an AI and making it physical and then we also ate soup with it because that's what you do. So I'm just gonna show you a bit because I think this, is, for me this was very, very interesting process because 
you know, when you're working with these technologies where you can actually train something to the concept of a spoon, you're actively deciding what is the idea of a spoon for this. So we curated our own concept of a spoon by, by kind of stealing a lot of images from the internet, but curating this, this data set of history, uh, normal spoon, boot spoons, and we also put some forks in them just for, uh, why not, to, to, to fuck a bit with the algorithm. But, you know, what's interesting about this is that, you know, so this we are using uh, something called a style gun, which gives you these blobs, you know, these are, it's very interesting because you, you get from these archives and you create this, this mesh of this map of things that you have to, you know, it's a little bit like looking in the, in the coffee grounds and figure out what is interesting because, you know, they're not very defined, but, but it's interesting. And you know, and I pass personally, I think close to, I think 150 million hours, uh, just scrubbing through, through spaces of spoons. And, and you know, over time I kind of got used to, almost like a map, I knew pretty much when to turn left or right to find something interesting, even though this thing is not actually on a plane, it's on 512 dimensions, which doesn't make any sense, by the way. So, you know, you get lost in this and you kind of really get a sense of the, 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 it becomes a weird collaboration. I mean, you become really partners. Um, and, you know, and then you get to, to kind of this stuff. Uh, you know, this is like, I don't know, there is something there, you know, you see something that is not clear and maybe there is, a, there is something interesting for you. But then, of course, you know, how do you decide what to do? You know, of course you can say me and my friend, my partner Matteo, we decide what is a good spoon. No, so we actually use another algorithm to help us define what's spoon enough in those images. And we got down to the idea that it should be, maybe it's 75% spoon is enough to make a spoon and not be boring. So 90 is boring. So when an algorithm gives you 95% is actually boring. 50, it's a blob. 75, Trust me, it's, you know, I would put it on, on a paper. <laughs> uh, but then, of course, you know, you're d down there, you're, you're all in images, and we're like, okay, let's try to make this like an, a physical object. And so we work together with a friend of us that is an experimental juror to create this, what we call the procedural press. So a way to actually simulate how you would turn those images into metal by pressing the shape. Um, and we, and we got to these kind of things that are already looking like spoon or like eating devices like we used to call. And, and here I think it was an interesting time because I think that thing looks like it's made by an AI, you know, because it has this glitch, uh, it's alien. I think Nelly was talking about alien, different sort of aesthetics. And I think artificial intelligence in that and the glitch of artificial intelligence especially is something that you, it has that non-human because this is not, this is decorative, but not in a way that we would do. But, but maybe this was too, that was too cheesy, that was too easy. And, and actually the one on the left is the, the direction that we went into because it's something very unexpected. You know, you, you have this, this little deformation that it's, I don't know, does that, is that a new function? Can you hold it in a different way? Can you turn it around? So, you know, you have this idea that somehow by this weird process, you get to something that, you know, not, you couldn't get there by yourself. And so we, we created, like from that thing, we basically created a, a collection that it's like, uh, we call it a latent collection because it's, it's kind of from that thing, it becomes some other things. Um, but, but, going back to this, if we were smart, we would have 3D printed this or just make NFTs, because back then NFTs were very cool, and probably make a lot of money by making infinite NFTs of Spoon. But no, actually we were not that smart. We said, no, let's actually go to some silversmith in Italy and convince them <laughs> that we can make some Spoon made by AI. And so we went through this interesting process that, that went through like four months of calls, meetings, with this, this old man named Gianni Greggio, that you know, we had to convince him that you, these spoons are interesting, then we needed to go to the, the silver guy to say that they were doing, it was doable. Then we went to the machine guy to realize, and we said, but why the fuck are we doing this? What do you mean by AI? So we went back 
to Greggio, to, to Gianni, and say, yeah, but you know, that guy doesn't, okay, let me go for it. Anyway, so we ended up in a four months process to kind of make actually real spoons in silver. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and it's very interesting because by the process of adding this last step of human intervention, so working with someone that actually understands spoons that we don't, and actually understand the materiality, it became even something slightly different. So the, the deformation that the, the algorithm had were kind of changed by human deformation by the process of making them. So we like to say these are, we are, they're actually called spawns, uh, not spoons, because they're spawned by a machine, but crafted by humans. Uh, you can actually still buy some of them. We, we made uh, just a hundred of them because it was a total nightmare <laughs> to make a hundred. Uh, and also they're a bit expensive, but I think there are still a few of them on, on our store. Yeah, and this is just like a little supercut of the whole process, so you can see where we went through. Uh, highly recommended not to do this, by the way. Uh, if you can make images uh, on mid-journey and make money with it, go for it, please. Uh, <laughs> this was a disaster, uh, but really fun. So, to conclude, um, one thing that I find interesting is that through all this process and having worked in this area and really having a, a close connection to, to, to machine and to algorithms, I, I mean, I, I'm a bit of an animist, but I think now I'm even more like a, a machine animist. I, I really feel for these models and I, I, I kind of have an interesting relationship with, you know, just talking to them and, and, and kind of seeing how they think. Um, but I think we are a bit, you know, outside when I look again, uh, when, I, when I stop and in my own rabbit hole, and I look again, you know, back at how we talk about this, we're really stuck in this narrative of having to, to define the, how much this machine is humans, is more like a human because, you know, now they are dreaming, now they're creating, and we're stuck in this idea because, you know, we, we really always have this comparison you know, how much this is human. And at the same time, on the other hand, we're also not realizing that a lot of what we're doing and, you know, a lot of what, what's happening behind the AI as well, but in a lot of our job, it almost like we, we are becoming more and more like machines without even realizing. And I think this narrative is not really interesting anymore because it constantly creates this friction about what is this and what does it mean for me? What does it mean in humanity? I mean, it's a technology and we can use it and, you know, that's, kind of it. And also, you know, it's such an egocentric and such a human-centric way of uh, looking at everything because, and it's also sad because, you know, we are still focusing, oh, he's a guy making better drawings than me. Like, who cares, honestly? Uh, and because my friend Tobias Ravel the other day told me, he was paraphrasing someone else, because he told me this thing and he's like, I was like, ah. You know, because anyway, most of reality happens at a completely different scale and time of human, so actually we should use these tools to explore other things than just what we do as humans. And I was, okay, that's, that's cool. Um, and this is where I, I managed to put in a super shameless plug, uh, which is after I, I, there is some book that I wrote that uh, actually there are gonna be a few available on, on the foyer. Uh, but I'm already interested in this idea of like how can we change this narrative, this fear, this constant conversation about what is human, what is not, and actually just uh, accept that we are in this weird time where humans are becoming more like things and things are becoming more like human. And rather than fear and dystopias and, and all of that, I feel that, uh, you know, there should be more fables, more, more new narratives. And so you can, you can buy this book if you want. It's, it's all in there. <laughs> now it's fables, it's not theory, it's a lot less, uh, um, you know, it's, it's for kids. So, so what I want to say, you know, when it comes to design is that there is so much more to explore and, you know, we just scratched the surface with our projects just by starting to question what we can do. And especially because we didn't stop at thinking about the fact that it's artificial versus human, that is about automating and making stuff easier, and then it's very anthropomorphic. Uh, and this in the background is, it's been a very weird experiment that we did in the studio uh, a couple of weeks ago where we actually somehow managed to use 
a, an algorithm to predict what we're gonna say next in a live call, so we effectively predicted the future. And, um, and yeah, and, and it, it freaked me out because you know, in, in 10 minutes, by putting together two APIs and some shit code, we actually managed to pretty well figure out what we're gonna say next in a live conversation. So, I mean, there is so much stuff that we can do. And so, so definitely for me, it's, it's really not about automating our work, but it's about creating new partnership. It's about feeling this as not only collaborators, but as new materials, as new, basically whatever metaphor you wanna find beside an assistant. Uh, and definitely it's not about making stuff easier. Uh, it's about making it harder, make, finding the new craft, finding what actually brings you a bit of joy. Because if we make everything easy, then what the hell are we gonna do with our time? And definitely, as you saw from a lot of stuff, it's not about making stuff better. I mean, you could easily make better plates and better spoons otherwise, but it's something, definitely something different that we couldn't have imagined in any other way. Thank you.